right, but we're not actually all connected. Okay, I'll, you'll, I'll let you give me, you'll give me a signal or something? Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're good, Ian. Morning. Good morning uh, and good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, I'm Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels. And really it's our great pleasure to welcome you today to this conversation on strengthening the transatlantic commitment to democracy, resilience, and civil society. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we have wonderful people with us today to be part of this conversation, uh, and I'll let uh, our moderator introduce them in, in a little more detail in a moment, but just to say at the outset, we're really delighted to have with us two longstanding friends of GMF, Katerina Matanova, who is Deputy Director General for the Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement at the European Commission, and Brock Bierman, Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia at the US Agency for International Development. Uh, two people really at the center of this uh, of efforts uh, on all of these fronts on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, let me just say that for those of you who are familiar with GMF, you'll know that our mission is very simply to strengthen transatlantic cooperation. Uh, and for many years, uh, our civil society programs, our civil society trusts have been an integral pillar of this work along with policy and leadership activities. Uh, and I'm very glad we also have my colleagues, uh, Gordana and Sergio with us today to be to be part of this conversation as well and to talk about what we're doing uh, in the region, uh, in the Western Balkans and in the Eastern neighborhood as well around the Black Sea. This is an important conversation, I think at many levels. First of all, uh, it's important given our mission, but more importantly, given the serious challenges confronting the region uh, on many levels, some of them longstanding, some of them very new and arising from the COVID challenge. Um, we're gonna have an opportunity to explore those challenges and also uh, to talk a bit about what is being done on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to address these problems. Uh, and critically, we have an opportunity to hear from, as I say, two very important players in this world about what actually is being done uh, from the European side, from the American side, and quite importantly, uh, and very important to GMF, what is being done together and what we could do together. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, say that we're also very pleased to have with us today uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Katz, who's senior fellow at GMF in Washington and who also leads our Front Lines of Democracy initiative. Um, to moderate the conversation, Jonathan, thank you very much and a very big thank you for putting this together. Let me turn it over to you. We look forward to the conversation. Great. Ian, thank you so much. Um, and we're, we're um, really pleased to have um, Katerina and Brock here today with us. And I really wanna to get to them because we only have them for a short <clears throat> period, but I think you outlined some of the, the, the key challenges obviously in the Balkans, but also uh, in Eastern partnership countries um, over the last several months. Uh, and what has been remarkable has been the response of both the, uh, the EU, EU DG NIR, and then also USAID in responding to the needs uh, in the region, the socioeconomic challenges. We're in the middle of, obviously the coronavirus was seeing a second wave um, in a number of countries. And what we're also seeing is continued effort and response um, of, uh, of partners of these countries, the US uh, and EU stepping up to support uh, civil society, uh, to support uh, economic challenges, uh, health challenges. And so I really wanna get to uh, Katarina and Brock, because I think I want to, you know, hearing from them about what the response has been, and I think, again, impressive, and Brock and I have spoken before about this, too. He's mentioned it's a 24-7 effort of the U.S. government to support this challenge. I can see the activity of, of, of EU DG near as well, and I think it's really important, one, to, I, I want to thank them, but also their, or their teams that are in the field uh, that have been working so hard uh, daily to address the challenges. And I think they're also, what I also remarked too, is that 
USAID and DG Near were there in these regions before with significant resources uh, and significant help. Um, and you're seeing that today, and they're gonna be there after. And so this is not just about uh, helping in a moment of crisis, it's about supporting the transition and integration of these countries into Euro-Atlantic institutions, but also making certain that democracies and civil society, free media, uh, stay strong, that we come out stronger out of this particular crisis right now and end in a better place. Um, also joining us, and I wanna just quickly thank my two colleagues, Sergio, who is the deputy director of the Black Sea Trust, and then also uh, Gordana Delich, who is the director of the Balkans Trust for Democracy. They're gonna speak today about the response of what they're seeing on the ground. And, and GMF is so thankful to be a partner of both DG Near and USAID in this region, working with both uh, in support of, uh, of civil society, in support of strengthening democracy, and addressing the COVID-19 challenges that are happening today. So if I can, uh, just one quick housekeeping before I turn it over to Brock Bierman, um, is uh, that obviously we're in Zoom, everybody's quite familiar with how Zoom works these days. Uh, the speakers can't see anybody but the other speakers. Uh, and there's a Q&A function uh, at the bottom or top, depending on, on what Zoom screen you have. Please uh, you know, pose your questions when you can throughout. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session after we have our speakers go ahead. Uh, and we really look forward to, to your questions uh, in the short time that, that, you have, that we have you with us. Uh, and with that said, I wanna turn it over to, to Brock Bierman. Uh, I think uh, Ian did uh, an initial uh, an excellent job, and I want to thank Ian Lesser as well and GMF leadership for this opportunity. Uh, Brock is the Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia at USAID, but also has been uh, an elected official, worked in the private sector, uh, brings tremendous experience, but also um, a real dedication. And we've had a number of opportunities to talk since coronavirus um, uh, started, real challenges, and it's really an honor to have you here, Brock, and I want to just turn it over to you right now to to kick off with your opening statement, and then we'll we'll move next to to Katerina Mathanova. Brock, over to you. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Jonathan, and good afternoon to our friends across the Atlantic. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, and uh, thank you uh, again, Jonathan, for this opportunity, and also the opportunity uh, to talk about how important civil society is to uh, our work. Uh, and thanks uh, to the overall German Marshall Fund for hosting this event today. Uh, 2020 has certainly been a challenge for the entire world uh, to deal with this global pandemic. And uh, USAID, along with its partners, including DG Near, have responded to that challenge. In fact, there has never been a more important time, Jonathan, to reaffirm the strength of that transatlantic alliance. Right now, uh, we have to be lockstep to work together to push back on this COVID-19. And USAID looks forward to continuing its partnership and building upon our previous work, uh, specifically in the area of civil society. Uh, I believe the Deputy General would agree that our combined efforts to support civil society today will not only help us to respond to this current crisis, uh, but strengthen our outcomes. And, and now, of course, just I, I do want to turn to the American response just briefly. Uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19, the United States has mobilized as a nation uh, to combat the pandemic. Internationally, the U.S. has committed more than $12 billion to the COVID-19 response, and of which more than $1.3 billion is coming from USAID and the State Department alone. Our support is attacking this pandemic from a variety of fronts. Uh, we're providing state-of-the-art ventilators, improving public health, uh, protecting healthcare workers. We're also strengthening laboratory systems and supporting disease surveillance and boosting rapid response uh, capacity in more than 120 countries around the world. In the European Eurasia region alone, the US government has committed more than 103 million in emergency health assistance. And we're proud to work alongside our EU partners in helping lead the COVID-19 response in this region. But it is also critical to point out that Americans don't just provide aid through the government. Our all of American approach is helping people around the world through the generosity of private sector, private businesses, nonprofit groups, charitable organizations, faith-based organizations, and individual contributions. But we're here today to discuss more than just the US's response to the pandemic. And more specifically, 
we are here to discuss the critical role that civil society plays in that response. In fact, now more than ever, civil society must play a critical role in our response, a role that can save lives. It is clear that civil society organizations are more than indispensable to their communities. They are the very heart and vibrant part of democracy. CSOs help communicate to people on life-saving public health measures. They advocate for sound policies to limit the spread of the virus. They provide oversight of government policies and performance in addressing the pandemic itself. And they provide critical and emergency services to vulnerable and hard to reach communities. But CSOs also ensure that our civil liberties and our fundamental freedoms are appropriately considered and preserved in the context of combating the virus. Now more than ever, leaders across the region should be embracing civil societies during this crisis as a trusted partner. In Europe and Eurasia, civil society organizations are responding to this moment with courage and dedication. They have dramatically transformed their operations and priorities to better respond to the need of their communities. Such organizations are vital resources for those suffering from the second order of impacts of this pandemic from food and housing insecurity to the rise in domestic violence and child abuse. At the same time, independent media are keeping citizens informed about the pandemic and their government's responses. Even while media organizations are suffering from sharp decreases in advertising or commercial funding, media outlets and civil society groups are scaling up their efforts to combat disinformation by providing relevant, factual, and timely information to all citizens. This pandemic has revealed why civil society is so essential. Across different sectors, though these organizations have been stepping up, serving the vulnerable, tracking government responses, and innovating to meet the diverse needs of people across the region. They are demonstrating to their communities why they are a main pillar of any real democracy. USAID is working with our local regional partners, including the Black Sea Trust and the Balkan Trust for Democracy, and from the outset of this crisis, USAID has quickly pivoted to support CSOs as they respond to this pandemic. We are ensuring citizen-led organizations have the grassroots knowledge, expertise, and energy necessary to develop local solutions for community challenges and to advocate for change on behalf of those same communities. So how are we doing this? First, I'm proud to announce today that USAID and DG Near are stepping up our support for civil society during this time. We are increasing our mutual support, trusted regional partnership, such as supporting GMF. And to address the secondary uh, impacts of COVID-19, we'll be working even harder together. For USAID's part, we will be providing an additional five million for these new funds uh, that will, or new funding that will ensure up to 300 local grassroots organizations can help lead their community's response to the pandemic. Second, we are helping organizations across Europe and Eurasia to transition activities to virtually, to, excuse me, to virtual platforms and assisting groups to maintain virtual communications with citizens, including the use of crowdfunding to sustain expanded uh, and expand their services. It's important to recognize these new technologies in order to keep these organizations going. Third, we're assisting local independent media outlets and investigative journalists who are reporting on developments related to COVID-19. Fourth, we're supporting local civil society at the grassroots level to engage with government institutions and provide independent oversight as governments respond to the pandemic. And finally, we are helping organization, organizations to better respond to the acute needs of their communities, including providing critical support to vulnerable groups disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Examples of our work include the work in Ukraine where USAID is supporting a popular edutainment show that uh, addresses timely, sometimes controversial issues in a humorous way. Since the outbreak, it devoted the majority of its episodes to helping change behaviors to slow the spread of COVID-19 covering topics ranging from social distancing and government quarantine measures to danger of democratic backsliding and medical procurements. This program broadcasts on both social media platforms, including YouTube, Instagram, Telegram, as well as local television stations, and has generated over 8 million views across these platforms. Recent polling has shown that Ukrainian citizens who predominantly receive their news from online services feel well informed about the issues related to COVID-19 and increasingly understand the importance of protections such as wearing masks and limiting social contact. 
In Moldova, we are supporting one CSO initiative to uh, help vulnerable families in rural communities. This group is helping families get access to mental health support, providing care packages, micro-investment, and distributing educational materials via a mobile library to children who are unable to attend school. When the media environment in BIH was overwhelmed by disinformation in March, a US support, USAID-supported uh, fact-checking organization formed a 24-7 emergency response unit to debunk, debunk the false narratives. Believe it or not, 156 debunks have been published, debunking more than 1,500 different pieces of disinformation from more than 500 media outlets. Disinformation ranged from outrageously false claims that 5G was the culprit for a large number of COVID-19 cases to, that uh, were reported to hospitals, and that also there were reports that hospitals were actually offering money to families of deceased victims uh, in order to recognize COVID-19 as the cause of death. Outrageous. And we owe a great deal of gratitude for these organizations to debunk and tell the truth and inform citizens. As a result, the organization's average monthly readerships from their website increased more than 500%. We are supporting similar in initiatives in Montenegro. At the regional level, we are helping virtually connect civil society organizations working towards similar goals. For example, we are supporting civil society groups in Romania and Moldova to provide vulnerable primary school children with a support system of teachers and families and older students to help them keep connected to their school communities and avoid disruption in their education. An example, we are engaged with, uh, with civil society and journalists in several countries to monitor public spending during COVID-19 and sharing best practices in monitoring efforts is, is something we're working on uh, as well. USAID views building up systems for public accountability as a high and top priority. People deserve to know how and where their tax dollars are being spent. We are also proud of supporting new efforts for civil society to fight COVID-related disinformation and respond to new COVID-related challenges. For example, uh, with USAID support, a number of fact-checking groups across Southeastern Europe have formed a regional fact-checking coalition. I'll share an example of the types of false narratives this coalition debunks. Uh, one lie tried to uh, convince members of the Geneva Conference that COVID-19 quarantines and social distancing efforts would be tried at the Court of Human Rights as a human rights violation. Another outrageous claim. The global scale of the false narratives is extremely troubling. Now civil society grants have also helped groups uh, address domestic violence and provide legal aid to people affected by the, the crisis. As the Deputy General will tell you, we are not alone in our support for civil society in the region. And our, our colleagues at DG Near have been great allies and friends in this area for many years. USAID has long recognized the importance of our partnership with like-minded public and private donors to reinforce, build upon, and amplify our assistance. When it comes to civil society support, we have enjoyed many years of close collaboration with DG Near, and we deliver much of our regional assistance through our trusted uh, strategic partners, including uh, through groups such as the Black Sea Trust and other regional civil society grant makers. Our mission also works closely uh, with the EU counterparts on the ground. In Ukraine, for example, USAID and EU are, are our technical leads routinely co-host society coordination meetings. And in Georgia, we're benefited from having EU technical staff join our assessment teams. Now, before turning it back to uh, Jonathan, because I've already talked too long, I want to underscore the importance of this discussion once more. COVID-19 is a public health crisis, but this pandemic has deeply affected other key sectors, both economic and democratic. Its impact can be felt far beyond our homes and the hospitals. This pandemic represents a generational challenge to the young democracies of Europe and Eurasia. It has created a space for nefarious governments and political leaders to weaken fundamental freedoms under the guise of public health emergency. Rather than serving their citizens, some leaders have used COVID-19 as a pretext to tighten their grip on the fundamental freedoms that we all enjoy. The rise in dangerous information, disinformation by those in power to control the press are very alarming. Indeed, the pandemic has created a fertile territory for the entire entirety of malign actors and for those same leaders who feel that uh, de democracies need to be managed. These authoritarians are ultimately short-sighted. They should recognize 
how much of an asset civil societies can be. These organizations serve as a bridge connecting communities with those they help and those who are in need. What I can't understand, frankly, is why authoritarian leaders keep making the same mistakes again and again by preventing civil societies from serving their communities. It seems to reason that real leaders understand the value of civil society organizations and the critical role they play in all communities. These leaders need to know supporting civil society is in their best interest. These organizations know their communities. They know what their neighbors need and they know how to respond quickly and effectively when a disaster strikes. And finally, for all those brave citizens who uh, face risks to help those in need and hold their government leaders accountable, USAID and our partners at DG Near continue to stand with you. Jonathan, thank you very much again for the opportunity to talk uh, this morning about this important issue. Uh, I'm looking forward to a, a lively discussion. Thank you. Brock, Brock thank you so much um, for your remarks. And I think it really highlighted the breadth of what the U.S. has done is committed to, what USAID is doing, <clears throat> excuse me, and also uh, I think what you really pointed to was a transatlantic response to the challenge. And I appreciate, and I think everybody does, uh, highlighting a couple of key issues, support for civil society, the role civil society is playing, uh, the challenges to democracy, and, but also uh, you know, that, that within the middle of a health crisis, uh, there's a socioeconomic crisis, uh, challenges, but also uh, the challenge of disinformation and those trying to take advantage of this moment to to move their agenda forward. And, and the fact that, that you and others are focused on this is, is incredibly important. And my colleagues as well, who are on the ground working with USAID and DG Near. Katarina, can I turn to you now? Um, obviously, uh, DG Near, you are in the middle of this of this challenge as well. Uh, to maybe to, to bring us up to speed on the EU response and DG near response, <clears throat> excuse me, in the neighborhood. And I can see what you're doing and, and, and it's, it's quite extraordinary, the effort that's underway to support uh, the EU's partners in, this, in these regions. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And it's great to be on a panel uh, back at the Brussels Forum, even in a virtual format. And great to be on a panel back with uh, with uh, Brock and with uh, Ian and yourself and other colleagues from uh, from the the trusts uh, that they uh, manage. Um, I would uh, first want to that the job that GMF has been doing traditionally is even more important now. I think the transatlantic uh, relations are, are at a fairly tenuous uh, moment. And I think that all the work uh, that we try to do together with USAID to overcome any tensions, I think is important, but the, the, the facilitating role of, of GMF and bringing us together is extremely, extremely, extremely important as we are facing a, a, an uncertain world and more uncertain world uh, for the future. Uh, I think that the pandemic indeed showed that we are all together in with this uh, in in the problems and and that nobody has a silver bullet i mean yes new democracies are suffering old democracies are suffering uh, authoritarian regimes are suffering i think that uh, it's it's not been easy for for many many countries to find the path uh, that uh, that uh, responds uh, well uh, some countries have done better than than others, and I very much appreciate uh, um, uh, Brock's uh, comments on the on the excellent work that uh, USAID has has indeed done uh, in the partner countries that uh, we share. You call them uh, bro uh, uh, Black Sea area. We we Eurocentrically refer to the European neighborhood uh, since we share a continent and. Uh, close to neighbor like the Balkans or the Eastern Partnership, but we indeed have been working uh, very, very closely together and, and, and increasingly so. So thanks to both the collaboration with USAID and to German uh, Marshall Fund that in fact has become in the area of uh, civil society, one of our strategic partners. It was uh, actually a conversation a few years ago uh, on the margins of the uh, of one of the physical uh, Brussels uh, fora that uh, spurred the idea of 
of establishing and, and, and working with a, with a broader set of uh, uh, partners that we have not uh, worked with traditionally um, and, and work with them on reaching their communities of support, uh, their uh, organizations they work with and, and, and reach beyond the traditional partners that, that were cir circling around the European, uh, European resources and, and spread the support uh, to civil society, uh, both the policy players, the, the service providers, the accountability uh, watchdogs, uh, the independent media, etc. And, uh, and indeed, this work has uh, uh, shown to be even more important uh, in the COVID crisis because, as Brock mentioned, there is a lot of uh, uh, leaders in the countries where we work with that use the use the crisis as a as a as a pretext for for uh, uh, maybe institutionalizing uh, for longer than necessary various restrictions on on uh, on uh, on uh, uh, civil civil liberties. So we very much need to need to uh, overcome that. And so we have, uh, in fact, in addition to I'll give an example for the Eastern Partnership region, in addition to the roughly 320 million that we have spent in the civil society or for this is supporting civil society since 2014, uh, we have ongoing programs in the East, in the Balkans. Uh, we have specifically, as part of the COVID package, set aside 10 million euros to, to help the civil society that's helping vulnerable groups, that's supporting uh, uh, independent media works on disinformation and really tries to tries to address uh, address the needs that came out through the through the crisis. So there's been a specific package for both the East and and uh, and the Balkans as part of our overall overall uh, COVID response. But let me let me get back to a little bit the the the, the overall COVID response as you. Uh, that that we have uh, mobilized in uh, in the European Union, uh, as as you would remember from the various uh, newspaper articles and TV. At the beginning, Europe was a little bit shell shocked by the onslaught of the of the virus uh, early, you know, in in Italy, in Spain, etc. So there was a little bit of a a little bit of, of a pause at the, at the beginning, but we very quickly realize that uh, to really uh, our, put our efforts together and try to see how we can use our new programming as well as reprogram and repurpose uh, programs to help our partner countries uh, address the crisis. Uh, this approach became uh, branded as Team Europe. And back in, uh, back in April, we, we actually mobilized uh, uh, from the European uh, budget, uh, 25 billion its contributions, and the European Investment Bank, it uh, is now above uh, 35 billion euros uh, of money that we have uh, dedicated globally to to, to our efforts. Um, in the Balkans, it's about three and a half billion. To the east, it's about uh, uh, 2.8 uh, billion. Out of that. And we really try to address three sort of buckets of issues. Uh, the first one being uh, the emergency assistance, uh, humanitarian assistance. Second has been uh, uh, special support for the medical systems, uh, medical equipment, but also supporting institutionally the, the, the health system of the countries uh, in the East was to the tune of uh, 80 million. And, uh, and then uh, to the tune of 900 million, we, we mobilized money for the support to the economy to provide both liquidity support as well as uh, uh, longer term recovery needs. In the Balkans, this has been altogether the three area of uh, 3.3 billion uh, euros, where we really tried to work not only with the government, but also with the with the business communities and the civil society to help address the impact of the of the crisis. Uh, you mentioned uh, both of you, both uh, Jonathan referred to it, and and Brock spoke about uh, disinformation. Uh, this is something that was extremely 
extremely, extremely strong, uh, especially at the beginning of the crisis. And uh, both in the Balkans and in the East, there have been uh, uh, from at least two state-sponsored sources, very uh, robust disinformation campaigns about Europe, about Europe not caring, Europe falling apart, uh, not having any any interest in supporting the partners, etc. So I must say that uh, this is something that I say with quite some pride that uh, we really, the first time in a, in a, and this is something USAID traditionally does much better than in Europe. We don't know how to communicate about what we do. This was really the first time that we said from the very outset of the team um, uh, exercise that the communication about it is at least as important as the actual support. And we really uh, uh, branded it therefore in, a, in, a, in a, an understandable way and communicated about our support uh, very, very actively both from Brussels, but even more importantly, by our people in the in the field, in the in the different countries. And I am delighted to say that uh, actually we turned the tide on the disinformation. We had the uh, Eastern Partnership uh, video conference, leaders video conference on the 18th of June, and uh, the day before uh, was uh, was published a big opinion poll from the uh, from the six uh, Eastern Partnership countries, which showed that, in fact, in all six countries, the citizens correctly identify Europe as the largest uh, uh, provider of assistance as, uh, you know, in the in the COVID crisis, which which was indeed, indeed heartwarming that that all the resources actually were recognized and were and that Europe was seen as helping that it was uh, it, it, it was trying to do so so that was uh, one way of, of, of addressing this information is debunking it which I think is really extremely 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 important and just br as Brock mentioned we also support a lot of uh, 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 various uh, initiatives that uh, debunk the uh, the disinformation coming from 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 the channels that we all know. We also have the eStratcom uh, task force in the external action service that does that. So I think the debunking is a, is a, a extremely important pillar of uh, fighting the hybrid warfare and disinformation. But but equally a strong uh, pillar is the positive strategic communication telling our narrative, telling our story. And so this has been, uh, this has been a lesson that, that uh, was well uh, uh, learned by, that, by us. Now, looking forward, uh, we have, uh, as part of the uh, video, uh, leaders video conference I mentioned in June, uh, we, we actually have now uh, a process of developing deliverables for the future. We charted out a new uh, a new policy uh, for the Eastern Partnership and the uh, support to civil society, support to human rights, support to civil liberties. Um, this is very much uh, and continues to be a critical component of it. And, and uh, I think it's not only a critical component of it, but sort of cuts across all of our all of our other other support, and this is equally true for um, both the Eastern Partnership and the and the Western Balkans, uh, for the Southern Neighborhood too. But uh, but broken, I share the geography that uh, that the uh, Balkans, and uh, we very much will 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 continue on this path and looking forward to working with such great partners as USAID and, and uh, the German Marshall Fund. I'll stop here. Great. Katarina, thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for sort of walking through sort of the, the, the depth of what uh, DG Near is doing, uh, the EU, uh, Team Europe. Uh, you know, we know that 
uh, and I've had an opportunity to speak with your your partners uh, with DG Near, but also other parts of the EU response, Devco, Echo. It's really impressive. And uh, what I find is that it very much parallels, glo- you know, sort of across the globe, what USAID and what the U.S. government is doing. <clears throat> and when you really combine the two together, it is it's probably the most powerful form, both in terms of assistance during this period, but also just on on issues of values that Brock raised too, which is democracy civil society, free media, uh, these two voices, Washington, Brussels, uh, member states of the EU remain the most important uh, uh, really spokespersons for these, for these, for these, these, these exact things. And so I just want to thank you for pointing that out. Jonathan, Uh, could I make a quick, uh, could I make a quick comment? I I, I just want to emphasize that even before COVID-19, uh, DG Near and USAID were very well linked up. I, we've enjoyed a great relationship, and, and, and GMF as well, as you know, as you n- mentioned, mm. that we've been working together uh, very closely for the last two and a half years since since I've taken on this position, and I've enjoyed a great relationship with not only uh, Katerina, and her, but her entire team, as, as well as my team and your team. Uh, it's been a very close co- collaboration, and I think um, that has really helped us respond uh, to this new partnership or, or the continued partnership, if you will. Absolutely, and we, we appreciate that, that, that trust and sort of the work we do and others and, and who we're working with on the ground. And so right now I wanted to actually do a little bit more of sort of going, sort of honing in on, on these regions. And I wanted to turn, turn to Gordana, who heads our uh, Balkans Trust for Democracy, uh, working across uh, the Western Balkans, but also has long been involved working with civil society working with partners, both European and, uh, and the United States as well in the region, uh, who's seen a lot in, in the Balkans. Uh, Katerina, you mentioned early on that there was some questions about the response. And I think uh, early on disinformation uh, challenges to how the US and EU were going to respond and support. And I think, as you said, you pointed to some polling numbers, the perceptions have changed. But it, you know, we know that disinformation is, is a constant battle. Um, it's one that's been going on even previous to COVID-19 um, with those that seek to uh, push these regions further away from, from the transatlantic community um, into, a, into, a, into the wrong space. Gordana, can I just bring you in? I know you, you wanted to uh, comment, but also uh, we're gonna turn to you and then Sergio will turn to you for, for for first question. So over, over to you, Gordana. Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon to everyone. And I would like to particularly w- welcome our um, speakers, Katarina Matrinova and Mr. Brock Bierman. Um, what to say? I mean, our speakers have said it all basically. Yes, indeed, the COVID-19 highlighted very much the critical role uh, of a vibrant civil society in response to such a crisis. Um, I have to thank to our partners such as USAID and Digineer for being so flexible and allowing us to adapt our programming in order uh, to support the civil society in the Western Balkans to allow it to have this really fast response to react and provide leadership Um, and even in many cases if not too many to basically supplement for the governments who were struggling to ensure the well-being of the of the citizens now the balkan countries continue to deal with the crisis but i think it really should be noted um, here that it was only the us the eu and of certain european states uh, this assistance to the civil society that was timely um, and that because of that reached uh, those who were in need, uh, bec- uh, thanks to the support to the civil society who knew their communities as uh, Brock Bierman was talking about, right? They knew where, where uh, the, the assistance, was, the assistance was, was mostly needed. So it happened. Um, this support has been crucial in both urban and in rural communities throughout the Western Balkan region. Um, And for me, this support is an absolute evidence that the transatlantic community deeply cares about people's lives, right, and their futures, about the democratic progress. To put it in simple uh, terms, uh, while face masks uh, do prevent us from, you know, uh, catching the virus, they do not prevent domestic violence. 
or wild as infection cars that uh, were received here as, as help, do help us decontaminate our living space. They do not prevent misinformation contamination of which we had way too many, right? So this assistance um, that of the transatlantic community is the assistance that is focused on all aspects of life, on all societal groups, and particularly on the most vulnerable groups. It has been a systemic response, which is why I'm saying that the civil society has, has basically replaced governments in certain cases where, where it was needed. So for me, um, you know, life is not just about physical life, it is also about the quality of life. And this is what I think has this crisis proved. Um, even though Katarina Matanova mentioned something really important, which especially was noted here in Serbia, that the EU was slow, right, in, in responding. But then when it responded together with the US, the response was overarching. And to me, this is the most important lesson from, from this crisis. Um, and I have um, a question, if you, if you allow, Jonathan, for, for our uh, speakers. I would really be interested, what what are the plans for the following 18 to 24 months of both USAID Indigeneer for the post-COVID uh, uh, time for, for our societies and for the Western Balkans? And do you think we could potentially see an acceleration maybe of the Euro-Atlantic integration of, of the Western uh, Balkans? And that's- I'm gonna let Katarina answer that first, but I- <laughs> Katarina. Um, well, for, for the well, thanks a lot for the for the uh, for the recognition that that uh, while slow at the beginning, then it then we came in force uh, indeed. Uh, look, I think that uh, 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 there is right now we have made in the last uh, several months. Uh, really fundamental steps on the Euro Euro European integration of the Western Balkans. And uh, I think that the uh, opening of the negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia, the agreement on it uh, was also, uh, you know, slow at the beginning, but then, then it happened. And I think that uh, uh, there is going to be definitely progress also with the front runners, which is Serbia and Montenegro, but it also depends on the readiness of the of the government to to uh, speed up their efforts. I mean, I think that uh, the 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 enlargement process is now a fairly transparent game in terms of what the what the expectations are. Then then it's the time for us to deliver. And that's why I was mentioning the North Macedonia, Albania situation where there was a, there was a little bit of a timing hiccup, but, but, but we did deliver in the end. Uh, but in terms of moving on the integration, that is going to depend on meet, meeting the benchmarks, which are fairly, which are fairly known. And we will, we will continue providing the support. So I think the momentum is there. And, but we need to use the momentum to the to the uh, best possible extent. So um, let me just say that um, as, as we look into the future in the, 18, the next 18 to 24 months, I think um, the first thing I would say is we have to be a student of history. We have to understand how uh, global impacts or, or global events, if you will, uh, will impact your trajectory of our programs. And we're gonna continue, and, and what I basically mean is we're gonna go going to continue to invest in our programs that we have worked on over the course of the last 30 years. We're, we're going to continue to work through uh, development of our sustainable development. We're gonna to continue to work with our countries on their journey to self-reliance. We're gonna to continue to help create partners uh, but we're also going to be flexible, and I and I think you know, in terms of our response, I think uh, uh, regardless of how you view it, we we've been pretty strategic about it, and we're going to be not only strategic but flexible, and we're going to understand how the secondary impacts of this virus uh, impact individual countries, and we'll have to respond individually depending on that circumstance. But as I as I think far out, um, and I and I think about the type of work uh, we're going to be involved with, I I do have. Um, 
concerns uh, of the economies of these uh, these countries, and we're going to have to look about look at our economic development programs, uh, which have always been a large um, part of our, our portfolio. In fact, uh, over the course of the, the the last ten years, I believe that they've been somewhere in the neighborhood of about fifty percent of our overall funding. But I think we're going to have to look at how we. Um, help these countries be resilient, how they respond. Um, and then secondly, we're going to have to um, really look at all of our uh, programs that we're funding currently to make sure that we're vested, that we're informed, and that we're, we're, we're protecting the investments, right? We want to make sure um, that uh, the programs that we've supported, not just um, in, in currently, if you will, but also uh, our legacy programs. You know, I, as I think about answering this question, I, I think about those programs that might not necessarily be supported uh, uh, now by USAID, but were supported in the past. And we have to, I think, go back and look at those legacy programs to make sure that uh, we're supporting them in, in the right ways, whether um, it's through resources or just through support um, to help them continue uh, in their, their, their efforts. And so again, I, I, I'm looking at uh, how, we, how we respond economically. And then also, of course, finally, we, we have to uh, protect democracy, right? We have to continue to be vigilant. We have to continue to hold uh, those, those authoritarian leaders accountable. Uh, and we're going, to be, um, we're, we're going to be very diligent about that. So th that's how I view the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, again, being flexible, being strategic, and making sure that we understand how uh, our, our previous investments are protected and we understand the past as we, as, we, as in fact, as I, we look at the, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, right? We need, to, we need to learn lessons from that and compare how we respond. So I think now is the time that we have to not only uh, uh, make it a priority, we have, to, we have to double down our efforts. May I have a two finger, may I have a two finger sure. uh, 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 addendum on what I was saying also in reaction to, 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 to Brock, uh, I was sort of talking about the European integration from the, from the formal point of view, but obviously integrating with the European is also reaching higher levels of it. And what we are uh, busily preparing during the summer is in fact is a, is a major economic uh, package for the Balkans uh, to, to, to help indeed with the, uh, with the, not only the recovery, but the growth that would increase the prosperity that would make it uh, possible for the uh, Balkan countries to, to uh, join the European Union in the future. Great. Th thank you. And I think uh, for both in terms of support for the Balkans is, is critically important. I think moving forward on integration, Katarina, you're correct about sort of meeting the, the standards, uh, particularly sort of democracy governance. Um, and I think USAID has been there too, you know, in, in support to help these, these countries as well. And if I yeah, could... I yeah, Can ahead. I just interrupt two more, uh, 30 more seconds? I'm sorry. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, talk about how we uh, look at things from a regional perspective, right? Um, you know, you're very familiar with the European Democracy Network, right? So I think we have to think about how we uh, approach development, not only from a specific country per perspective, but not only, but a regional perspective, uh, a European perspective. And that's why we have to, one, uh, look at how we um, get young people invested and we how, how we do it across um, uh, borders and that we are uh, fully engaged with making sure that they are leading the way and then also making sure that they are reaching out beyond their communities to help each other. No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Sergio, can you, I want to bring you in too. Obviously, uh, when we talk about geography, uh, Black Sea Trust, um, is working across you know, the Black Sea region and partners both with USAID and with DG Near. Can you uh, also just provide a, a quick comment? And I know you also have uh, a question uh, prepared as well. And thank you so much for joining. And you've been a long, you've been so, uh, long engaged with civil society in this region and you're one of the real experts on the challenges um, uh, faced in, in all of these communities. So I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to the distinguished speakers uh, and the audience that joined us today for this very important webinar. Uh, let me first start by thanking on behalf of the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation, our long-lasting partners and trusted friends from the USAID and the Um 
we are uh, very proud and thankful for their continuous support and leadership in navigating these times of crisis that affects us. I would like to highlight the importance of GMF BST's relationship with both USAID and DGNIR in addressing critical and topical issues the Black Sea region is facing for the past decade, and even more so now when the COVID-19 deepened and also exacerbated issues such as the state of democracy, civil society resiliency, free media, and access to trustful information. It is utterly salient and also reassuring to see that this partnership between USAID and DGNIR uh, is a great example of how the transatlantic community works together to promote good governance, transparency, accountability, and respect for human rights in a region where basically democracy is still being learned and debated as the right model for developing the societies. We feel emboldened to know that the US and the EU will stand by the citizens of this troubled region and further advance the democratic values and the robust civil society. From where I stand, uh, the challenges uh, are quite many. They have been already described in great detail by our, by our distinguished speakers. Therefore, I only emphasize what we as civil society donor organization are able to see from our day-to-day -day operations. The first one, there is a general trend of democratic backsliding in the region, given the fact that most governments had introduced emer emergency situations to fight the pandemic. While the measure in itself is pertinent, some governments saw this as an opportunity to restrict some fundamental rights, to reduce transparency of the public procurement procedures, to persecute political opposition and human rights defenders, or to silence independent media on grounds of spreading disinformation related to coronavirus. In order to respond to this challenge, we strongly believe that there is a need for enhanced oversight of government policies and watchdog activities on behalf of civil society organizations to hold the governments accountable. There is a great potential for abuse and only by constantly reporting and exposing those abuses, we can make sure that the politicians will think twice and refrain from such malign practices. The second challenge uh, is a huge wave of disinformation, misinformation and fake news related to the coronavirus, but also targeting to disrupt democratic processes in the Black Sea region and faith in the public institutions. GMF BST grant making has been streamlined in this period to also counter this phenomenon by supporting fact checking, debunking fake news, and provision of trusted media content to the populations. Nevertheless, the speed of producing and spreading the fake news exceeds the capabilities of civil society and free media sometimes. Therefore, we feel that more efforts have to be put into this endeavor. Third, and uh, let's say uh, not least important challenge is that there is a, a commonality for the whole region uh, which is insufficient support for vulnerable groups that are most affected by the pandemic, victims of domestic violence, loss of jobs and income, lack of personal protective equipment. GMFBST, with the support of USAID and DGNIR is addressing this issue for the past several months, providing legal and psychological support, as well as IT support for children for whom online education is not available. Given the long-term challenges and the fact that the virus is here to stay, we see it as a great challenge and one that needs to be addressed for the foreseeable future. And I will have a, uh, a question to both uh, Mr. Bierman and Ms. Maternova. Um, given into account this uh, democratic backsliding, is conditionality still a viable tool to encourage much needed reforms uh, in the Eastern Partnership countries as opposed to appealing loans offered by, you know, Moscow, Moscow or Beijing, who do not come with the conditionality to them. Thank you, and I will stop here. Who, who wants to tackle that one first? Look, I, I, I would just say yes, conditionality is still available to encourage, encourage but I'm going to let Katerina uh, uh, tackle that on a, first. I, uh, well, uh, I think it's uh, it's 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 definitely a tool that helps shape policies, and, and uh, the fact that we may ha have uh, backsliding here and there does not invalidate uh, does not invalidate that approach. I mean, I uh, 
uh, I uh, both worked with a, in a country which was on the receiving end of conditionality of various uh, various international players, and now I'm on the dishing out end, and uh, it needs to be done well. It's it's an art rather than a science, and uh, it needs to be well calibrated, well thought out. You need to provide support to the countries to to be able to meet the conditions, which we try to do. But I definitely think it's uh, it it is viable. Is it going? Is it easier to take a loan from China than it is to 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 get it from the European Union? Sure, it is. Uh, and so that that is always going to uh, uh, factor in. But we now see that after uh, even in the Balkans, after after uh, a number of years of preference going for you know Chinese uh, infrastructure investments, the tide is turning and they rather adopt uh, standards uh, uh, of whether procurement, whether environment, whether labor standards, etc. that uh, that that are ours. So uh, yes, is the uh, I'm coming back to the short answer that also Brock opted for. Yes, it is still a viable tool. Yeah, and, and Sergio, yeah. I just Oh, Brock, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just I was just going to say that I don't think that conditionality alone is the solution. I also believe that civil society and, and the, the general public at large, right, they need to be part of the reform process. They need to articulate the needs uh, and the demand for uh, for uh, transparency. So it's, it's going to take uh, more than just conditionality. It's going to take public participation. Yes. I agree with that. Absolutely. And that's where civil society plays such an important role. Uh, sort of watchdogging uh, those that conditionality. And Sergio, thank you again. I'm sorry I didn't get to say thank you for sort of providing your perspective and sort of regional perspective. And I know we probably could spend we could have a session on each the the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, but also on the on the Balkans as well. We have a very short period um, sort of left, and we had uh, a lot of questions. Uh, and so I wanted to to sort of bunch a couple together because I know that uh, both Katarina and Brock have to run, they've got meetings, they've got some things that they're doing directly related to the things that we're talking about. Um, but I wanted to maybe just put a few of them together from our audience. Um, first of all, there's an overall sort of a number of these questions that are very thankful for both the support uh, for both, uh, both DG Near and, and also USAID. Uh, so I wanted to recognize the comments, the very positive comments uh, that were made. Uh, there's a couple of areas that, that the audience and others participants are asking about um, country specific and one I, I did I think is really relevant right now um, is Belarus uh, because of the upcoming uh, presidential election and what's taking place on the ground um, of great concern uh, and GMF has long played a role working with civil society in Belarus um, as well and, and you know Katarina and Brock I know both of you have spent a lot of time thinking about this and I'm sure within the EU and the US, there are responses to, to what's taking place. Maybe I could just ask you um, from, from the audience perspective, where does Belarus fit into uh, overall engagement and, and thoughts about uh, the current situation and, and response of the transatlantic community to what's taking place pre-election? I don't know who wants to, to jump in first. Well, I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to just really quickly just, and I know we're short on time. Well, first off, um, yes, we are paying attention. Um, I'm disappointed with what I'm seeing. Uh, and um, we're going to be very vigilant to support civil society, uh, not just in Belarus, but through all uh, of our countries in uh, our portfolio, uh, specifically in those countries outside of Belarus that have authoritarian leadership that are taking advantage of the situation and also leveraging uh, uh, their own uh, uh, administrative abilities to uh, further their own political goals. But I, look, Jonathan, I think that we also need to be aware that there are other issues that we need to be paying attention to and, and with our countering the line Kremlin influence. And we're also looking at the, the Chinese Communist Party. We're, we're, those are going to be high priorities too because they're influencing the process. 
um, and, and they will have impact on elections throughout the entire region. And I wanna make sure that we're, we're paying attention, whether it's uh, through elections or through uh, the economies, whether it's an approach from the Kremlin or uh, an economic approach through, through uh, the communist the Chinese party that we're really working toward um, making sure that we help our countries become independent and make the decisions for themselves. Thank you, Katerina. No, I, I think I can uh, uh, subscribe to that. Listen, we, I personally follow Belarus very, very closely. They came to us uh, for support uh, to, to, to help with the economic uh, crisis that, uh, that uh, is the result of, uh, of COVID. They have been hit very, very strongly and we are in negotiations and discussions with the with the authorities but at the same time we are watching very closely what's happening uh what's happening uh, uh you know on the pre-election arena the european parliament has been uh, particularly vocal uh about that and uh i i mean the the, the news don't seem to be getting better before the elections uh let's uh, let's hope Hope that uh, they're not going to be getting even worse after the elections. And uh, I, I personally belong to the group of people that believe that it's better to be engaged than not to be engaged uh, uh, with, with, with Belarus. Number of years of, of non-engagement and I don't think that uh, uh, I think that we achieved a lot more through the engagement. But uh, but clearly there there are there are limits, and I very much hope that that the regime will not uh, test the, how just how far the limits are on our side. I, I, I'm totally in agreement with you, Katerina. I mean, we've had some really great dialogue with Belarus over the course of the last two and a half years since I've been in this position, and it would be very disappointing to see all of that just disappear. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, to help Belarus uh, realize its own uh, uh, independence and its own goals, who they are, what they want to achieve. And it's not a matter of, of choosing one side or the other. It's a matter of them deciding which uh, direction they want to go in. So we agree on that. Can I just add one question too? And I wanna, and then I'm gonna turn to you both for, for final comments. Um, several of the questions, uh, one, there was, um, an appreciation for support for, for independent media. And this was coming from both um, uh, questions coming from both the EAP region, but also the Western Balkans and Balkans as well. Number of questions about how, uh, how can DG near, how can USAID uh, increase support? They're appreciative of the support, but given the moment in time, but even the financial challenges, what are the ways that, um, that both the United States and EU can best support in independent media. And then in addition, I wanna add one other thematic issue, which is, is countering corruption. Uh, both of you mentioned, touched on um, efforts to ensure transparency. Um, you know, I think the one challenge in, in, in these regions too has been, has been the fight against corruption and weakness and rule of law. Uh, and of course, we're seeing some backsliding uh, related to that. Um, what all? What can? What are you thinking about when it comes to strengthening the effort to combat corruption and also independent media? And I'm sorry, I'm sort of bunching together a couple of questions, and then I'm just going to turn turn to both of you for for final questions. Uh, Brock, do you want to tackle that first? That. Work? Yeah, look, um, first, uh, there, there were a lot of questions in there. I hope I cover them all. But um, first off, look, I, I think we just have to be vocal about our support of independent media. And we have to be outspoken. And, um, and we also have to be consistent with our actions, right? So we're backing up at USAID our support for civil society for independent media uh, with the resources, with the expertise, and with the partnership with DG Near. So look, actions speak uh, as well as words. And we're going to continue down that path. Um, secondly, look, I, I think that um, there's never been a more important time um, that we come together uh, and work toward uh, supporting those issues and making sure that we, we cover together. Um, and it's not just a matter of, uh, in fact, it's, 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 it's um, efforts like this, right? It's um, being able to come together in forums such as this to make sure that we are um, uh, 
articulating what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we continue to do in the, in the future. And, and I would just say, Jonathan, I'm looking forward to, to doing this again. I know we're short on time. That's why I'm kind of talking quickly here. But I would just say, hey, um, sign me up for another session. And and I would just also say that, you know, I tweet out a lot, right? So be Beerman at USAID.gov. I, I, uh, people can follow and see the work that we're doing and, and uh, actually participate with that as well. Hello? You're muted, John. Yes. Thanks. Katarina, just uh, over to you. Thanks, Brock. And, and I'm sorry we don't have more time, but maybe just on your final thoughts and if you want to weave in you know, some of these topics. And I just wanted to thank both of you. I know you both have to run, so we appreciate you, you taking, uh, taking this time. Katarina, over to you. Thanks a lot. I, uh, well, you mentioned the two areas, which I think both are one on supply, one on demand side, uh, extremely, extremely important for the for the democratic development and for the next period coming out of the crisis, which is the support for media and which is the governance issues and anti-corruption. So I think that both are going to be at the center of our attention and they are, they're linked in a way because I, I, I am uh, convinced that the best way to address corruption in countries that are still going through a transition from the previous regimes in countries that are uh, still building institutions where the institutional strength and resilience is not fully there. In, so right. in inst institutionally weak environments, it's much easier to fight corruption before it occurs through transparency, through exposing things, through uh, um, uh, making rules in such a way that prevent corruption from occurring closing space for corruption to occur rather than rely on law enforcement institutions that you don't have or don't have as strong as you need them to punish corrupt behavior once it happened and and in that in that sense the uh, civil society is absolutely indispensable media are indispensable investigative journalism, the skills of investigative journalism are indispensable. That's something we are investing in. And also supporting the new business model of media, which has been so dramatically changing uh, because of, the, of uh, the social media. So I think it's, it's really finding ways how to be most relevant for the new business models of media, as well as working on uh, the investigative skills and the and the broader media literacy uh, among people, because uh, what's very interlinked with it is the whole issue of disinformation we talked about and, and critical thinking. So I think that the audience put their finger on, on, on some of the uh, really central areas for our support, which are going to be part of our um, future work, both in the Balkans and in the East. And my mm -hmm. last sentence to, to uh, 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 last thought to leave with you is that the, just to say that the meta um, narrative, the meta message of our new communication for the future of Eastern partnership, in fact, is resilience in all its aspects. Uh, and that's, that is a concept that really talks to the economy, environment, civil society, governance, everything. And, and we discovered that the, the most relevant concept that has been tested over the last few months is the health, health resilience. Yeah. And um, at the, on this note, I'm afraid I really have to ring off, but uh, okay. huge, okay. huge thanks for inviting me. Katarina, thank you. And thank yeah. you to, for, for all the work DG is yeah. doing. Uh, Brock, I know we could spend more time. I just want to thank both of you, for all of our speakers, Gordana, Sergio as well. Um, and on behalf of the General Marshall Fund, thank you for this conversation. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, yeah. Hopefully we'll have another opportunity to do that. Stay tuned to both of the Twitter accounts of both Brock and Katarina too. Uh, you get a sense of what's happening uh, in both of their uh, portfolios. And thank you both to DG Near and to, to USAID as well, to you and your teams in the field and others that are working uh, to provide the support and resilience 
Um, and I, I, I think uh, even though I know there's a team year for DG Near, I like to think of Team Transatlantic when I hear both of you speak. And, yes. and thank you. And we look forward to our next conversation. So we're going to sign off and, and thank you to everybody who put this together. Thank today. you. Thank you. Thanks, Emiliano. Thank Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank Bye, Brock. Take care. Thanks. Bye, Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.